All right, I've got a lot to talk about today, so um, really focus, do your best to stay awake at this early hour, and uh, I'll do my best to try to keep you awake. I'll uh, remind you, reminder tomorrow from 3 to 4 o'clock, um, one or two representatives from the company Allianz will be here to talk about what actuaries do and what, in particular, what actuaries do in their company, um, and so you can come there and listen to what they have to say and also make a contact or two if you're interested. And uh, even if you're uncertain about whether you'd want to be an actuary, you know, come, come to find out. Treats will be provided, but please do let me know if you plan to come so we can get enough treats. Make sure um, um, today would be a good day to let me know if you plan to come. Okay, so that's tomorrow from 3 to 4 o'clock. 3 to 4 o'clock, it is going to be in CC 30. All right, um, first today, let's consider something we haven't considered yet, infinite limits and limits at infinity, and consider a couple of kinds of example problems that could be proofs that could show up on the, the second exam. Um, an infinite limit would be something like this, a statement that as x approaches some fixed number, like zero, for example, some function, grows forever and ever in an unbounded way. It's unbounded on some interval containing zero. And in, in fact, in this case, it's unbounded upwards, just upwards. I made it one over x squared instead of one over x. We can write that that equals infinity. Now I'm implying that an infinity is a number here. We're not dealing with cardinality here. This is really a function that's diverging as x goes to zero, but it's diverging in a special way. It's going up forever and ever. The graph looks like this. You've got a vertical asymptote there at x equals zero. Um, and it's going up forever and ever on both sides, not up on one side and down on the other side. How would you prove this? Well, you have to have a good definition for what it would mean for this to happen. What should that mean? You should be able to reason this out without looking in the book. Arbitrarily large, larger than any given fixed number, as long as x is sufficiently close to 0. If you think along those intuitive lines, you could say something like this. For all, we'll call it capital M, you don't have to say M is positive, but it doesn't hurt to say M is positive. For all capital M, say they're positive, there exists a delta greater than zero such that f of x gets higher than that capital M for all x in a deleted neighborhood of C. satisfying the condition that the distance of C is less than delta. Since it's a deleted neighborhood of C, I'm implicitly saying X is not equal to C itself. It doesn't matter what happens when X equals C. The function could be defined at C or not. Again, the book takes care of this by saying the distance between X and C is greater than zero. But I'm including this deleted neighborhood language just to kind of get you used to it. Now I could have phrased this by saying, let f be defined in the deleted neighborhood of c at the start. Whereas the book says, suppose i is an interval and c is in the interval, and f is a function defined on i except possibly at the point c. All that kind of preamble in the book. It's kind of long-winded. It's a little quicker to, to phrase it in terms of deleted neighborhoods. So how would you prove this? What if this were an exam two question? You'd have to use this definition. You'd have to say, let m be given. Let's sketch the idea of the proof. Let m greater than 0 be given. 
maybe it's probably better to just call this scratch, scratch work, scratch work for proof. How close does x need to be to, to 0 in this case, x is going to 0, in order for this function to be greater than the given m? So I'm wondering, when will this be true? How should I choose x? How close to 0 should I choose x to make this true? I want this to be true. Well, essentially, just solve it for, for x. If you take the reciprocal of both sides, x squared, this is going to be equivalent to x squared being less than 1 over m. m is positive here. It is worth saying let m be positive for the proof. Those are equivalent. And this is equivalent to, careful, the absolute value of x being less than 1 over the square root of m. So for the proof, if we actually did the proof, I mean, you say it verbally, you'd say let m be given, m greater than 0 be given. You'd say choose delta, exists a delta, to be this, 1 over the square root of it. And suppose that x is within delta of 0. But this is true. And then work backwards get that f of x is bigger than m. Do you think we could actually run through that? Time sake, I think I better not. Yeah. Understanding sake. Understanding sake is important, but we've got a lot to do today. OK, you could rewatch the video and write down what I said for that part of it. For watching the rest. Well, you said that we have to work backwards, so there's more work after that? Well, this is just the scratch work. The actual proof I didn't write down. So let m, I'll say it real quick again. Let m greater than 0 be given would be the first sentence in the proof. Let delta be 1 over the square root of m. And suppose x is within delta of 0, meaning that this is true. That would mean this is true. That would mean this is true. You're done. Work backwards through. What about uh, a limit at infinity? What does that mean? Uh-oh, where are the erasers? Oh, great. I could write next door. Do you want me to write next door to see if there's one? Yes, yeah, see if they have an extra one. There's a whiteboard eraser over there, but I better not use that, huh? I did accidentally write, use a marker on a smart board once. The room had both a whiteboard and a smart board, and I was using a whiteboard, and I just forgot. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can clap. <laughs> what would a limit at infinity be? You're letting x go to infinity or minus infinity. Again, we're not treating infinity like a number here. It's not like cardinal numbers. And your function is going to have some horizontal asymptote. Let's consider an example like this. This limit, you should all know, is 0. Prove it. Well, you'd have to know facts about exponential functions and logarithms, but assuming we know that kind of thing. But what, is the, what does it mean? Limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equaling some number l, what does that mean? Well, f is going to have to, first of all, be defined for sufficiently large x on some interval from a to infinity, first of all. I'll just say that verbally. This is going to mean that you can get arbitrarily close to L by letting x be sufficiently large. Think in those kind of intuitive ways. Epsilon would be your measure of arbitrary closeness to L. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists what should I call it? Maybe capital M this time, being the thing that you have to prove exists instead of the given thing, I want to make f of x close to L by letting x be sufficiently large. Capital N is, M is going to be a sufficiently large number. I don't have to, it doesn't have to be positive here, but again, it doesn't hurt to put it there. Maybe for extra emphasis to sort of with your intuition. You want f of x to be close to L. 
So this should be small, that distance, within epsilon, for all x such that x is bigger than that. I hope we're at a point where you look at this kind of seeming gibberish and it kind of makes sense to you now, right? When we first wrote this kind of stuff, probably for most of you it seemed like kind of gibberish, but I hope you feel like it's making sense. I do want you to understand, and I do, I do emphasize understanding, though I did remind you before the exam that sometimes memorization is necessary and it is important. You can memorize things too and eventually the understanding can come. Retrieval practice. Probably the best way to memorize quizzing yourself. What's the scratch word for this proof, uh, for this example? <clears throat> you want the distance between e to the negative x and zero to be less than any given epsilon. That's equivalent to this. And since e to a power is never negative, at least if the power is a real number, that will be different in complex analysis. Uh, you can get rid of the absolute value sign. Assuming you know that the logarithm, natural logarithm function exists and you know it's an increasing function, you can say that this inequality is equivalent to this one. Find <coughs> the natural log function to both sides. Since the natural log function is increasing, the inequality doesn't switch direction. Right? The graph of natural log goes up. So you're trusting that that's true and writing this and then simplify. That's equivalent to this and this is equivalent to the seemingly strange looking thing for the purposes of what we're doing. X must be bigger than the negative natural log of epsilon. Huh? So X is bigger than a, a neg M is a negative number? No, not necessarily. M is not necessarily a negative number. Realize when epsilon is real close to zero, less than one, natural log of epsilon is going to be negative. So this is actually a positive number when epsilon is close to zero. Can you see it okay? And the smaller epsilon is, the higher this positive number is. Now, if epsilon is bigger than 1, then this does happen to be a negative number. What that's saying is that any m uh, that's bigger than 0 would work. I could even use a negative number for m to get this to be true. Which should make sense if you think about the graph of e to the negative x. Getting below 1 once x becomes positive. But in the case where epsilon is really small, this will be positive. So how would the proof go? You'd say, let epsilon be given. Let capital M equal that. And again, it doesn't matter that here that M could be positive or negative. And in fact, I don't have to even say, say M is positive in the definition. Or existing M, M theoretically could be negative. Then work backwards. The logic would work backwards, and you don't really show this. So you don't don't put the word "want" there anymore. I did want to say a little bit about your exam. If you haven't heard, the average score was about 80. The high score was a, was 91. Most people scored in the 70s and 80s. It was a relatively low standard deviation for the exam. Um, average was typical. Standard deviation was a little smaller. Than Or not at all. Nope, it goes, that's pretty typical. That goes with what's in the syllabus. <laughs> Curves are only good typically when your exams are really, really hard, actually, and your scores are really, really low. Curves are really bad things. This happened to my dad. Curves are really bad things when the exams are too easy. My, my dad was an English major in college. And he got a test that was too easy, and everybody scored in the 90s. But because the professor curved it, he got like a 92, and it was an F. Even though he got 92 out of 100. You know, 
95 was a C, 98 was an A, something like that. So curving is not good when you're doing the music. <sighs> exactly. Um, I want to get on to the intermediate value theorem and the extreme value theorem and thinking about their proofs, which could be on the second exam, or at least parts of them, perhaps with some guidance. Everybody hear that? Could be on the second exam. But let me just summarize some other important facts. <coughs> you should know the facts about continu continuity of arithmetic combinations of continuous functions, including polynomials and rational functions. So by arithmetic combinations, I mean addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. When you combine continuous functions in that way, you get continuous functions. Initially, just at a point C, we're talking continuity at a point. But then, again, a function is continuous over an entire interval if it's continuous at every point in the interval. If it fails to be continuous at even one point, then it's not continuous on the interval. So polynomials being linear combinations of uh, power functions are continuous. Power functions themselves, like x squared, can be proved to be con continuous by knowing that the function x, the identity function, is continuous, and then the fact that when you multiply two functions, like x times x, the result is continuous. Rational functions, and whenever you hear rational functions, think ratio, but technically speaking, it has to be a ratio of polynomials, not any old ratio, are continuous wherever they're defined, as long as you're not, as you're not dividing by zero. By the way, I hope you do know, I hope you do remember that just because you're dividing by zero in a certain rational function it doesn't mean there's a vertical asymptote there. You have to factor the numerator and the denominator completely to see that in certain examples, take a simple example like this, that is undefined at x equals one, but there's no vertical asymptote at x equals one because if you factor the top, it's got a factor that can cancel at the bottom. This equals x plus 1, as long as x is not 1. So the graph of this rational function is actually a straight line with a point missing. It's the graph of that with one point missing at x equals 1. That's the graph of that rational function. It is undefined at 1. That's not part of the domain. It's not continuous at one. But that is a removable discontinuity. You could fill it in if you wanted to. It's, and make a new function equal to that one all the time. It does have a limit as x approaches one. That limit would be two. Trig functions are continuous. Uh, that proof that you had involving the sine function for today, today was supposed to be really easy, actually. Uh, delta could be taken to equal epsilon. You can write that proof in two or three sentences. You're trusting that this is true. The book told you that's true for all x and all c. So prove sine is continuous at an arbitrary number c. Given epsilon, let delta equal epsilon. If this is less than delta by assumption, then this is less than epsilon by that inequality right there. We're not proving that inequality, we're just trusting it. Okay. Once you trust that it's true, you can experiment with different numbers to believe it yourself. Once you trust that it's true, then it's an easy proof that the sine function is continuous everywhere. And the cosine function. And tangent, for example, is continuous wherever it's defined. It's a ratio of sine of x divided by cosine of x, so it's going to be continuous as long as you're not dividing by zero. I hope you all remember what the graph notation looks like. It's got vertical asymptote of pi over 2, and what else? 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, etc. Cotangent, <coughs> secant, cosecant. And they're 
And composite functions and inverse functions are also continuous. I outlined the proof that the composition of two functions is continuous. That's easiest to prove without the definition. Instead, using sequences and facts about sequences and the relationship between conversion sequences and limits that I wrote initially on the board incorrectly two class periods ago, but I corrected myself last class period. In section 3.3, they prove that inverse functions are continuous in certain situations, all the situations we encounter at least. The gist of the theorem that I'm talking about is that if you've got a continuous function that's strictly monotone on some interval i, I'm drawing i's if it's open, but it could be closed, or it could be half open, half closed. You could include the left end point, but not the right end point. You've got a continuous and monotone function. It will have an inverse. It'll be one to one. And that inverse will be continuous as well. The inverse will be defined on the range of this function when you look at um, its range over this domain i. The, the book calls the range j. Ever see this notation in algebraic? F of, this is not a point, that's a set. See that notation in algebraic? You should have, with homomorphisms and subgroups. If phi was a homomorphism like this and H is a subgroup of G, phi of H, the direct image of H under phi, is a subgroup of G prime. This is the set of all possible outputs. It's the range or the, the image of the domain, in this case, I. Again, if f is 1 to 1, the inverse function is going to exist and have a domain equal to this range, f of i equals j here. And if the original function is continuous, then the inverse function will be continuous is the gist of the theorem. It should be very plausible that that's true if you think about what you learned in pre-calc about the graph, the inverse function being the, the um, graph you would get by flipping this graph across the line y equals x. Though you actually can think about this without the flipping, I hope you know this, if you take a mirror, turn your head sideways, and look in the mirror, you're looking at the graph of the inverse function when you do that, graphed in the ordinary kind of way, with the um, independent variable being to your right in your, in your field of view. I hope you know that. You can experiment with it if you like. Get a mirror out, turn your head sideways and away from the board or your paper and look at it. It'll look like an ordinary graph and the graph you'll be looking at will be the graph of the inverse function. You don't have to do the reflection across the line y equals x. So that's it. maybe even more confirmation that if you've got a graph that's continuous, its inverse could, should be continuous because it's really the same graph when you look at it that way. Just thought of from a different perspective. But the reflection idea is pretty convincing as well, though not a proof. The book proves it uh, using a lemma. It's, it's kind of technical, not super exciting. <coughs> I was reading it yesterday and I was feeling tired. It was tough for me to slog through. I was feeling tired. I understand how you feel. Real analysis does sometimes make you feel tired, doesn't it? Right? Reading through that. It can be exciting too. But when you're feeling tired already, it's tough. Get the caffeine out. Inverse functions in general actually aren't always continuous, even when the original function is. Here's an example of a continuous one-to-one -one and onto mapping whose inverse is actually not continuous. Huh? Didn't I just say inverses are continuous? Those kinds of inverses created from those kinds of functions, real valued functions defined in an interval that are mon strictly monotone and continuous. Evidently, this is a different kind of function in here. What is it? The 
this is a function that's going to map that line segment onto the unit circle, and this animation is supposed to emphasize what's happening. You kind of got to imagine the points being sucked from the line segment on the left and shooting over to the circle on the right. I suppose I could have tried to animate that. What's the, what's the formula for that function? It's a parametric curve, really. Similar to one of, one of our main examples we always consider in multivariable calculus, that one there. That maps the interval from 0 to 1 onto the entire unit circle in a 1 to 1 way. So its inverse function must go back the other way. And intuitively, it can't be continuous because to do that, you'd have to cut the circle. And cutting is an, not a continuous kind of geometric operation. You have to cut it at the point 1, 0, and kind of unravel it. Points that are arbitrarily close over here can be far away under the inverse map. Going backwards, you cut it and unravel it. Inputs just above the point one zero and just below the point one zero give mapped points that are far away in the plane segment under the inverse map. So, once again, the comment about inverse functions being continuous is dependent on the special type of function we're considering in this, in this class. Let's focus now on our mega theorems here. Intermediate value theorems, theorem and the extreme value theorem. I'm going to write down the statements and we are going to think through the proof. You could call it a sketch of the proof or maybe just the scratch work or the idea of the proof. I'm not going to write out everything for the sake of time the book does. I've got the written out proofs in the book that you can study. I have put questions, proofs on exam two related to these proofs. Not typically in the entire proofs, but parts of them perhaps, or maybe maybe the whole proof in pieces with some help, that kind of thing. Okay. So you probably will get one kind of question like that in your exam too as well. I did state the intermediate value theorem in, in a way slightly different than the book. Last class period. I didn't assume that f of a and f of b were necessarily different. And that led to me saying that c could be a or b, could be an endpoint of the interval. And the function, the intermediate value there, f of a equals f of b, and v has to equal those. And the c that you get in that, with this example would be a and b. Both work. The book, in its statement, does not assume f of a and f of b are the same. In fact, the way they state it, it's implicit that they are different, that they are distinct. So suppose f is a continuous function with this closed interval as, as its domain and codomain r. Here's my abbreviation for continuous, CNTS. And again, abbreviations and proofs are fine. Okay, to save some writing space. Abbreviations are fine. Sentences are important, but abbreviations are fine. Not just continuous, but you should say what it's continuous on, on the entire interval. And suppose V is between f of a and f of b. Implicit on this statement in the book's telling of it at least is that f of a and f of b are distinct, different. I'll go ahead and put that in there as an extra assumption. 
I'm not saying which one is greater than the other. Could be either way. Which, by the way, doesn't mean the function is necessarily increasing or decreasing. It could be going up and down. The conclusion in the book is then there exists a C in the open interval from A to B. Such that F of C equals V. V being the value, the intermediate value for the intermediate value theorem. I alluded to how to prove the exercise you had for, for the homework due today, where you were trying to show a polynomial had at least a certain number of roots using the intermediate value theorem. That's a common application. There's another kind of application that's important and will come up on the next assignment. Related to finding what are called fixed points of mappings. Let's go back to our cobweb plot thing. When you look at one of these cobweb plots, The intersection of the graph of the function you were iterating, in this case, mu times x times 1 minus x, where in this picture mu is 2.75. Looking at that picture, evidently the intersection of that graph with the blue line, which is y equals x, is important. And in fact, if your input value was the point of intersection, or the value of its coordinates, that would be what we call a fixed point. You get the same point back out again when you plug it into the function. The sequence would be a constant sequence. How do you find such a fixed point? You've got to figure out where the graphs intersect. Where does 2.75x times 1 minus x equal x? The function, the red graph, is 2.75x times 1 minus x. The blue graph is y equals x. For what value of x do they intersect? About, well, 0 and about 0.636. Coordinates of that point are about 0.636 comma 0.636. Actually, that might come out to be a nice number if I use a non-decimal thing here, 2.75 being, say, 275 over 100. Of course, I could reduce that, but 7 11 is what that was. In general, how would you prove such a point exists, other than just saying, well, trying to solve it, solve the equation, or saying, look at the graph? You'd have to use the intermediate value theorem, actually that you have to modify the function that you apply it to. Solving the equation f of x equals x is equivalent to solving f of x minus x equals 0. So if you create a new function g of x to be f of x minus x, that's the function you'd want to apply the intermediate value theorem to, to show that that's zero somewhere. So you'd have to figure out an inter interval, A to B, where it's either positive or neg negative at A, and the opposite sign at B. If F is continuous, then this will definitely be continuous. The intermediate value theorem will take, say there's a point between A and B, where G of C is zero, and therefore f of c equals c, that'll be a fixed point of the map. That comes up on the assignment for Friday. Let's briefly look at the problem I'm thinking of in a way that is always confusing to people. This is a problem that people typically find confusing. It's 
problem nine on page 107. The goal is to prove that any continuous function whose domain is a closed interval and whose codomain <coughs> is the same closed interval has at least one fixed point, a point that maps to itself. Did you catch that? Let's look again. Any function whose domain is closed interval and whose codomain is the same closed interval, emphasis on same, that's continuous on, on that entire closed interval, will have a fixed point. There will be some number c <coughs> such that f of c equals c. You'll need to use the idea I just mentioned here. You'll need to use the intermediate value theorem. And you will need to use the fact that the codomain is assumed to be the interval from A to B. That will be very relevant for finishing the problem. People always find this a bit tricky. Once you get it though, you, you look back and say, oh, that wasn't so bad. That kind of thing. I think that tricky one you have for today wasn't one that you look back on say and say, oh, that wasn't so bad. It was still tricky even upon reflection. But this one, it seems tricky at first. But once you figure it out and write it down, you look back and say, oh, that was, that was easy, actually. It's that kind of problem. That does happen. There are actually, here's a quick aside here about phenomena we can observe. There are actually other points that can be found through solving equations somewhat similar to what we have that are not fixed points. But in particular are what are called period two points. Notice when mu is just above three here. This box kind of thing that sort of comes down, well, when mu is just above three, well, it's hard to tell. Maybe I should put mu is exactly three in here. When mu is exactly three, that wasn't what I was expecting. Okay, um, you get this boxing kind of behavior in the cobweb plot, which ultimately ends up meaning for certain situations, there's what's called a period two point. It doesn't get mapped to itself, but it gets mapped to some number that maps back to the original number. And so the sequence oscillates up and down between those two numbers. It's called a period two point. To solve for such a point, which I believe only exists once mu is bigger than three, like say 301 over 100, Let that equal f of x. You don't solve the equation f of x equals x. You solve the equation f of f of x equals x using the function twice. For what values of x do you get back to where you started? The two fixed, these are the two fixed points. They get back to where you start after two iterations. These are two new points that toggle between each other. When you plug this number into the function, you get this number out. When you plug that number into the function, you get this number back. Okay. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon that can happen. And it sort of generalizes the idea of a fixed point. What's the proof of the intermediate value theorem like? Let's outline or sketch or do scratch work for the proof. Actually, I'm mostly going to just draw a picture. I'm not going to write much. Let's do like the book, The Case for the Function. Um, where f of a is less than f of b. It's not necessarily an increasing function. And in fact, I think on purpose, I'll make it go both up and down. But f of a 
is less than f of b. And v is some number in, in between. <clears throat> the book's approach to proving that some number c exists so that f of c equals v is to consider what are called pre-images or inverses <coughs> of certain sets in the codomain. That's a concept from algebraic as well. Here we are back to a group homomorphism. What if you've got a subgroup of the codomain and you consider this thing? Is that a subgroup of the domain? Yes, it is. What is that thing? It's called the inverse image or pre-image of h prime under phi. It's the set of all points in G that get mapped to points in h prime. You use inverse function notation, but it does not mean the inverse function exists. Definitely group homomorphisms don't have to be one-to-one. -one. Okay. If, they're, if they're both one-to-one -one and onto, you call them isomorphisms. So if they're just one-to-one, -one, then you sometimes call them monomorphisms, but probably you didn't hear about that. It's not necessarily an isomorphism. It's a group homomorphism. It can map two distinct elements to the same element. It can map everything to the identity. E prime and G prime. Right? You use E for identity elements in group theory. The inverse image, the set of all points in G that get mapped into H prime will be a subgroup of G if H prime is a subgroup of G prime. If you haven't added algebraic, this is probably, you know, if you're confusing. It'll make more sense once you get to algebraic. But the notation is what I want to talk about using here. The book does not do what I'm about to do, but I want, you, I want to inform you about it. The book considers inverse images or pre-images of this form. Well, that pre-image. This does not mean F is Invertible. It does not mean the inverse function exists. You can still use this notation in spite of, well, for this one, the, the inverse function doesn't exist. This is not one to one. Fails the horizontal line test. Horizontal lines go through it more than once, some horizontal lines. But you can still talk about the points in the domain that get mapped into this interval whose outputs are less than v. And theoretically, it could go negative, possibly, in this picture. What are all the points between A and B? If this is a subset, not a subgroup, a subset of the interval from A to B. It's a subset of the closed interval from A to B. What are all the points? in that interval whose outputs are strictly less than v. Um, well, for one thing, all the points between a and that number, not including that number. But also, all the points in this open interval have outputs less than v. Anything more? No, it doesn't look like it. If, if the graph went back down below V again over here, then there would be another interval. So in this visual example, this set consists of this half-closed, half-open interval, and this open interval. That's what this set would be for this picture. And the point they construct, so to speak, to be the C, such that F of C equals V, is the soup of this set. And in this picture, that would be this point right there. 
let C equal the soup of this pre-image set. The book doesn't use that notation, but that's their idea. They describe this in set building notation. Okay. Maybe that would be good for me to do. This is the set of all points in the closed interval from A to B such that f of x is less than b. It's a subset of the interval from A to B. Now, this set in the abstract doesn't have to be an interval or even a union of intervals. You don't know what kind of set it is. But it is definitely possible and not too hard to prove that um, there will exist a sequence in this set that converges to C. Given any set, non-empty set, there will be a sequence on an empty bounded set, there will be a sequence in that set that converges to its super. Actually not too hard to prove. I would encourage you to think about it. Actually, it's not too hard. Call that sequence Cn. Cn is converging to C. And it's in this set. You're not considering elements that are outside that set. This is a sequence in this inverse image in the shaded regions, not the unshaded regions. Well, in this picture, you, you have to get close to C over here. You could have some terms over here. But eventually, you've got to get arbitrarily close to C. Cn is going to be a sequence in that set converging to C. Definitely, such a sequence exists. Then the continuity comes into play. Continuity of f, it's assumed to be continuous over the entire interval, which is necessary because <coughs> you don't know where c is. But f is continuous at c because it's continuous over the entire interval. That's going to imply that f of cn ultimately converges to, um, well, okay, it doesn't necessarily converge to the a priori, but it's definitely less than or equal to b. <coughs> um, well, okay, sorry. What am I trying to say here? Cn is less than or equal to c. Well, f of bn is definitely cn. Each of these, by definition, essentially is less than b because they're all in this set, c ends. And that's going to mean the limit which will exist by continuity will be less than or equal to b. This exists by the continuity. And in fact, by continuity, it does have to equal f of c. So it's not only existence, but it's um, that equality right there. That's true by continuity. Since c n is converging, I knew the limit would have to exist. And in fact, yes, the limit does have to equal f of c. So that ends up proving f of c is less than or equal to v. And then the book also takes a sequence in the complement of this pre-image converging to c. In fact, that they pick a particular sequence. They call it dn equals c uh, equals a. No. C plus b minus c over n. They define a sequence that way. Think about this when n is when n is 1. This becomes C plus B minus C, which is B. There's B1. When N is 2, this becomes C plus B minus C over 2. 
That's going to be the midpoint of the segment between C and B. This is D2. D3 will be C plus B minus C over 3, one third of the way from C to B. That'll be D3. This will definitely be a sequence that's converging to C. And it's also in the complement of the set, which means the outputs F of Dn don't satisfy this condition. They satisfy this condition, which means their limit ultimately satisfies the same condition. F of C will be greater than or equal to B. That got complicated real quick. It's hard to get your mind around in such a short time. So, you're going to want to study the Wilkes proof. Yeah, I, I, I'll find it. You probably are feeling not so good about this right now. Okay. I outline the idea. It's helpful to think of a picture. Now I'll look at the Wilkes proof for those kinds of details. You end up showing f of c equals to b by showing it's both less than or equal to b and ultimately greater than or equal to b. Which means when you combine those two facts, it must be equal to b. Yeah, that is an F of C. Yep, because DN converges to C. Not CN, though, like as well. CN converges to C as well. CN converges to C in this kind of way. DN converges to C in this kind of way. What about the extreme value for it? Hang with me, we're almost done. I'm going to state the extreme value term now, and I'm going to state it in a way different than the book, which it seems like I'm doing consistently these past couple lectures. And it's not just for the purposes of being different. Okay, If it was just for that purpose, I wouldn't do it. It's to educate you about other kinds of terminology and notation that people use. And it'll be helpful, especially in chapter 8, at the end of the course. It'll be helpful to think of it this way. EVT, extreme value theorem. You're going to write, write it this way. Suppose I is a closed and bounded interval. And that F has I as its domain and R as its codomain and is assumed to be continuous on I. The conclusion is then F of I, the direct image of I under F, is also a closed and bounded interval. So this is definitely different from the way the book states it. You can have the book open if you want to to compare. But it does mean the same thing. And it's worth stating this way because in chapter 8, it's stated this way for one reason. And this is a standard way to think of it in a class called topology, if you ever take topology. Though there's some terminology that's a little different in topology. Notationally, if I happens to equal the closed interval from A to B, and we're saying F of I, the direct image of I under a continuous map F, is also a closed and bounded interval. We could say that there's some alpha and beta where this is true. Which means there's some C and some D in I where 
f of c equals alpha and f of d equals beta. And therefore, f of c is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of d for all x between, well, in the interval, the closed interval from a to b. And that's the key thing, the key way the book breaks it. There exists a c and d in the interval from a to b in this case. So that f of c is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to f of d for all inputs in the interval. f of c is the minimum value and it is attained. There is a c equal such that f of c equals that minimum value, alpha. And f of d is the maximum value, the global maximum, and it is attained. There is a d where f of d equals beta. The proof is kind of long. It uses the completeness axiom in a few different spots. And in particular, the Boltzano Weierstrass theorem, which depends on the completeness axiom, comes into it. The fact that bounded sequences have convergent subsequences is a fundamental part of the proof. We don't have time for it. I guess we are out of time, but uh, make sure you're really studying those proofs well. Okay, see you on Friday.